Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 84th, 83rd meeting, 83rd meeting of the Myelin Group. My name's John Davis, and I'm director of the Myelin Group. Before we begin, I say a very warm thank you, as always, to our esteemed friends from Hewlett Packard, now in the ninth year of sponsorship. When I was a pup, uh, you know, people would ask, um, what do you want to be? And I had never, never had a clue. I knew that I loved politics, I knew that I loved history, I knew that I loved economics. Um, growing up in uh, Essex at the time, it meant uh, I was hoovered up into banking. Um, uh, but I was talking to my dad about this, and what he would say was um, that he didn't know what he wanted to uh, do either. But you, you, sh you often find one person in, in your life who you actually want to be like. So just a few days after my 18th birthday, I was on the trading floor at Hambro's Bank, amongst some nice people, plenty of not so nice people, uh, a very aggressive atmosphere, great camaraderie, etc., etc. plenty of multi-millionaires who would speak Latin so I didn't understand them. And what, what was particularly interesting for me and my particular career path is that actually amongst all these, in, and you know, Ham, Hambro's was a proper blue chip organization, um, there wasn't one that I wanted to be like. Just didn't see it. Um, so two years later, I left, and uh, I ended up here. Um, you can see where this is going. Um, <laughs> and quite simply, it was in the first and second year, I wasn't in Peter's orbit then, wasn't in any of his seminar classes, been in one or two of his uh, lectures, but probably haven't paid as much attention as I should have. Um, but it was in the third year that I eventually came into Peter's class, and within a, just a few weeks, it was sort of like, that's what I want to be, that's what I want to be. So I started here, I'd left, I started, came back, then went again. And when, and when I came back, it was one of my happiest days when Peter asked me if I'd like to be a seminar teacher on cabinet and premiership. Seven years later is one of my proudest days when I was asked if I wanted to inherit the actual class when Peter uh, gave up teaching under, undergraduates. For me, it's one of my most honoured moments to be asked to chair this book launch. The book launch, distilling the frenzy, writing the history of one's own time. Um, I'm told that this is the nearest that Peter will get to writing a memoir. Now... In some respects, that makes me a bit sad because, I don't know if you know, it's a bit of a double plug here, uh, we have Alistair Campbell coming next Wednesday evening uh, to launch his final diaries on the Iraq war. Now, you know, imagine if we had Peter's version like that. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, how, you know, who he hated, uh, you know, uh, what, what this one was saying to that one, how he was right all the time, you know. <laughs> Um, so I, you know, I, I think we'd be a bit sad by that, and you know, one or two of you might want to lobby him to uh, get at his diary. Um, on a happier note, um, I'm sure most of you heard him on the Today programme this morning. Um, and I thought, you know, I thought there was several, several interesting points there. Number one, it was all too brief. Number two, I mean, I'm a big fan of Justin Webb. I thought, you know, but I, thought, I, thought, I thought he was a little bit sharp in his questioning. He might have been looking at the weather at the time, because it was just coming up afterwards. Um, the impression that I got, though, was that it didn't go deep enough. And this is where I think Peter might not actually um, believe, believe this himself, but I think he was being hugely modest when talking about um, why he does what he does and how he does it. Um, because from my point of view, I think that there was a missing dimension. And that missing dimension is practical application. I think one of the things that contemporary historians, certainly I do, um, Professor George Jones, I remember us having a very interesting conversation in the rain in a Cafe Nero when we were going to a Gresham College one day. And that is that, you know, contemporary history, there's a dimension to contemporary history for some contemporary historians, for most I would argue, um, although, Peter, you were right to say that it means different things to different people on the, to, on the t Today programme this morning. But I think that what me and George were looking at was how actually you know, there's an element of wanting to solve problems, of wanting to offer real practical advice to government, politicians, business, journalists, etc. Um, 
And so, you know, from my point of view, I think that the, there was great modesty on Peter's part because, again, from my point of view, I think from our Mile In Group's point of view, um, Peter's maybe been the, you know, the most, uh, the foremost practical applier of history of government and politics over the past quarter century or so. There are, there are other notable people, but I think a lot of people would agree that you know, you've been the first among equals. That, pr that practical application is really the embodiment of what we try to do with the Myelin Group, of which Peter is now the patron. So, I give you the voice of Radio 4, <laughs> 3, 5, Live, whichever you, you, you like, the one, the only, Lord Hennessy of Nimsfield. Thank you, John. That's excessively kind. Wonderful to see you all. It's true, when my old friend Sean McGee, who's up there uh, from Bite Back Publishers, um, persuaded me to do this, it didn't take much persuading, uh, basing it on a number of lectures, particularly the Wiles lectures I delivered in Belfast last month, that I realised as we went along, Sean and I, that it would be the closest I ever get to writing an autobiography. I had once planned to write an autobiography, and I didn't get further than the title, which would have been, had I written it, I've never been one for gossip, but. <laughs> so let me start with the title I have adopted, Distilling the Frenzy. It comes from the favourite passage of mine towards the end of John Maynard Keynes's 1936 classic, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money, in which he wrote, Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years ago. More on that in a moment. First, a few thoughts on the impulses that turned me towards the historian's trade and what now amounts to quite a bit of academic scribbling. Though I doubt if many madmen in authority have ever, take, ever taken much notice of it, despite John's kind words, which, to be honest, is a bit of a relief, because I believe that preaching should generally be confined to the clergy and visions to mystics, rather than to Whitehall special advisers and the usual impedimenta of government who all feel the need to have a vision these days. It is very odd that we're an extraordinarily secular society and yet we use the language of the mission tent. Mission statements, visions, dreadful. My Catholic formation is showing. But the first and indispensable impulse to be a historian is, is I think what Albert Einstein called a holy curiosity. In human beings, this takes a vast variety of forms as does the power of imagination with which it's twinned. My imagination, such as it is, is heavily historical and has been in terms of my conscious memory since the late 1950s, at the very least, when my sister Kathleen, who's here, gave me Unsworth's... Um, was it, what's it called again? Looking at History, Senescence, the book that shaped me more than any other. I can't even remember the title of it. For Christmas in 1958. The hippocampus bit of my brain, the memory sector, is the most developed, although, as you've just seen a second ago, somewhat fraying for somebody born in 1947. And I always had a certain sympathy with that extraordinary scholar-politician Enoch Powell on, when he's talking about history, I had a degree of sympathy, uh, when he declared in one form, as he did quite often in one form or another, to a student audience at Trinity College in Dublin in 1964, that the life of nations, no less than that of men, is lived largely in the imagination. That is the first and last impression I will do of Enoch this evening. <laughs> Not only to relieve you of embarrassment, but me of throat strain. Yet in that same speech devoted to Britain's history as an imperial power, Mr. Powell went on to claim that all history is myth. It is a pattern which men weave out of the materials of the past. The moment a fact enters into history, it becomes mythical, because it's been taken and fitted into its place in a set of ordered relationships, which is the creation of a human mind and not otherwise present in nature. Even on less sensitive topics, there was always an air of the psychodramatic about Enoch Powell when he came into the BBC Broadcasting House for a Radio 4 analysis discussion I was chairing, whether it be with Tony Benn on the Royal Prerogative. As Zaria Masani, who's here, will remember, we rarely left the 16th century in 45 minutes of discussion with those two, as you can imagine, or with Roy Jenkins and Dennis Healy on Cabinet Government. He was always extraordinary. He'd say, would you like a pea, Enoch, before we start? No, 
I, I, always, I always broadcast on a full bladder. It puts one on one's metal. I mean, he's a very hard chap, really. <laughs> he has not been a role model for me, as you can see. <laughs> but the most extraordinary speech he made about history was to the Royal Society of St. George on St. George's Eve in April 1964. And using the historical threads that bound him, he possibly revealed more of himself that evening than he had up to that point with his distillation of historical imagination, which took him back to the late Middle Ages. This is what he said. Backward travels our gaze beyond the grenadiers and the philosophers of the 18th century, beyond the pikemen and the preachers of the 17th, back through the brash, adventurous days of the Tudors, and there at last we find them. In many a village church, be beneath the tall tracery of a perpendicular east window and the coffered ceiling of the Chantry Chapel, from brass and stone, from line and effigy, their eyes look out at us and we gaze into them as if we would win some answer from their inscrutable silence. Tell us what it is that binds us together. Show us the clue that leads through a thousand years. Whisper to us the secret of this charmed life of England that we in our time may know how to hold it fast. Imagine those thoughts intoned in the West Midlands accent, rising up sentence by sentence as if he was some kind of classically educated air raid siren. <laughs> in contrast, the distillation of my frenzy is deeply, deeply prosaic and covers but a tiny patch of our past in terms of its concentration. And mine is Britain post VE Day, 1945. It spans the generation that stood firm during the Second World War, finally prevailed with its allies, then bred me and my generation. Mine is not a thing of effigy and line, of 800-year-old village churches, much as I love them too. Mine is an early welfare state Britain, an age of relative political consensus, possessing a strong sense of stoical, admirable, recently shared past of great and sustained collective effort. And buckled to this was a post-war austerity, an absence of conspicuous consumption, out of which we thought would come a juster, healthier, better educated and more socially harmonious country when easier times returned. That was the aspiration, and that, I have to confess, is still my sustaining myth, my gold standard, which I profoundly hope that era will not prove to be the high watermark of institutionalised decency in British history, though I strongly fear it might. There will, no doubt, in the next few minutes, be a whole sheaf of my sustaining myths running through what I'm going to talk about. I'm especially prone to this, I must again confess, in those passages of personal history where, as Seamus Heaney put it, hope and history rhyme. For example, when talking to Steve Kelly, a fellow member of my generation, about his new study of Britain in the 1950s, I found myself saying that in the early to middle part of that decade, in the afterglow of the 1953 coronation, which coincided, as you know, with the successful ascent of Everest by a British and Commonwealth team, and the UK crafting the first commercial jetline of the comet, pioneering civil nuclear power, mixing quite naturally, it seemed to me, even then, the deeply ancient and the highly modern, and the feeling that one really did belong to a success story nation. Now, professional historians aren't really allowed to get emotional to any degree like this, but tonight I'm letting rip. What the hell? And it did feel good. No doubt it was full of illusions, and the rockier patches in Britain's fortunes since that boyhood formation of mine have very definitely not felt good. And as during the summer riots of last year, they still don't. I'm not as Anthony Trollope described his fictional Whig liberal Prime Minister Plantagenet Palace of the Duke of Omnium, one of them for whom patriotism was a fever, but I've always taken it badly when things run wrong for our country, especially when an element of own goal scoring is involved. Yet the pitfalls of writing the history of one's own country within very largely the compass of one's own memory and experience of it are trumped, I think, by the perpetual fascination of its curiosity-filled pursuit, undertaken, one can only hope, in the spirit of Spinoza, who declared in 1677 that I've striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, nor to hate them, but to understand them. This, I think, is easier to do if you've lived through the years you're attempting to recapture yourself. There's a greater chance that, as a historian, you will avoid what Edward Thompson famously called the enormous condescension of posterity. And this applies as much to the big questions as high, of high policy as it does to what Jack Plum called the deadly intoxication of well-expressed malice. 
I thought that was the most amazingly autobiographical line of Jack London. <laughs> it's in his famous Pelican, History of the 18th Century. <laughs> Nobody did it better, well-expressed malice than Jack Plum. Sitting in his tower in the Dordogne, Mrs. Montaigne, not Jack Plum, sculpting, sculpting his essay of books, Montaigne wrote a passage about the power of rumour in the shaping of history. This, he declared, is the material of history, naked and unformed. Each man can make a profit of it to his understanding. I have a love, as one or two of you in this audience will know, for rumours twin, which is gossip, whether intoxicatingly well expressed or not. But Montaigne's line about the material of history naked and unformed is a fine description, I think, of all of us, not just we professional historians, the moment we spring from the womb. Because we forever live our own history, even if most of us never write it or otherwise record it. We're all human footnotes to our own times. In my more frivolous moments, although I avoided doing it on the wireless this morning, I sometimes define contemporary history as gossip with footnotes. But there's yet another motivation I must acknowledge. It's the great American Paul Samuelson, the great American economist. He once said, never underestimate the vital importance of finding early in life the work that for you is play. And Samuelson shaped the minds of countless young economic students across the globe with his books. But I only wish more of us had the great good fortune, as I've had, of finding work that was also play. I managed to do it as a journalist and Whitehall watcher for 20 years on a number of papers and as a full-time academic here for another 19 so far. No, it's nearly 20 now. And certainly the House of Lords for me has been a house of pleasure and fascination since I first slipped in there in late 2010 for a number of reasons. One, it's the most agreeable form of adult education, but the real reasons are that you get weapons-grade gossip every day. <laughs> And the food is 1950s without the rationic. It is pure heaven. <laughs> pure heaven for a child of my age. The economist with whom I began, the incomparable Maynard Keynes, singled out two particular branches of learning in that quotation from which the title of my new book's drawn. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, he said, both when they're right and when they're wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And then comes madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy, as I quoted a moment ago, from some academic scribbler of a few years back. But I like to think that if Keynes were writing today, he might have brigaded historians with his economists and political philosophers. For several members of our recent political class like to talk in their toe-curling postmodern fashion about the need to create a convincing narrative. I hope I'm not alone in this when they say we must find a narrative. A little flat neon sign, deception, deception, deception <laughs> goes up. And they want this narrative, you see, to beguile and manipulate the electorate. Parties compete not just for votes, but for their interpretation of the recent past. As if the blessing of history could bring a kind of benediction to what the great Victor Rothschild unforgettably depicted as the promises and panaceas that gleam like false teeth in the party manifestos. <laughs> Contemporary history, well-researched and written for what the American political scientist Gabriel Armand called the attentive public, should be the antidote to the virus of crude political capture. Though we contemporaries have our own deformation professionnelle too, unless we're very careful. For example, there always lurks the danger of an agreed view amongst a few authors, a kind of informal authorised version. But before digging further into the caveats and the concerns, how do I see those of us who make our living by taking our students and our readers back into the more recent layers of compost that made them and their country what they are? We are, I think, a scholarly equivalent of those stay-behind groups that the British Secret Intelligence Service and the American CIA had ready lest the Red Army really did move westward without the mutual annihilation of the nuclear war and succeed in occupying parts of Western Europe with Warsaw Pact and Soviet forces. My old friend and mentor, Paul Addison, caught this stay-behind impulse in his fine work of British post-war social history, No Turning Back, when he lingered on the significance of placing a photograph amidst its pages of himself as a 14-year-old member of Lower Five Modern at King Edward VI School in Lichfield in May 1957. Would I, Paul asked, if I could, put the clock back to Britain as it was in 1957? 
hardly. The gains we've made since then outweigh the losses. I have to admit, however, that the passage of time has left me with a sense of disorientation I can never quite suppress. At some barely conscious level of my imagination, said Paul, the England of which I was a part in the late 1950s is forever the norm, and almost everything else that has happened since is a puzzling deviation. Much as I like to think of myself as fully adult, Paul went on, I know that somewhere at the back of my mind lurks a schoolboy forever putting up his hand to ask why smoking is banned in the cinema, or why passengers on the railway are referred to as customers, or why so many couples live together without getting married. I know exactly how Paul Addison feels. The difference between us is no more than four or five years, 200 or so miles, and the names of our grammar schools. For Addison, read King Edward VI, Litchfield, 1957. For Hennessy, read Marling School, Stroud, 1961. And I suspect we contemporary historians all have an equivalent. And it's a useful spot from which to peer back and forward, to sniff the air, plenty of coal smoke around in 1961, despite the Clean Air Act 1956, and gave upon those little tiny cars, the steam locomotives that were still puffing around the country, the clothing. On wet days, we all draped ourselves in those dreadful Packamax, even the Queen. I noticed she wasn't wearing one the other day, but presumably, uh, Everything's moved on, including her drapery. Harold Macmillan was the Prime Minister I read about every day and whose ripe and decidedly overdone tones and style I came to admire. And he's as vivid today for me as Macmillan, and perhaps more so than David Cameron, who claims him as one of his heroes, which is interesting. It was still a time to look up if you heard a jet engine in the sky or to peer with intense curiosity if the little tiny A35 that my father drove with a reckless abandon crossed a motorway bridge. Can you imagine being excited looking at the M1 crossing a bridge to Northampton? <laughs> we made very little go a long way in those days. <laughs> it, was an era, it was an era too when Cliff Richard, Cliff Richard mercifully was soon to be superseded by the Beatles, of whom he'd yet to hear a chord or a whisper. I, some of you, I think, have heard me on this before. I mean, there are many reasons to be so thankful that the world didn't end in October 62 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, though we were very close, I think. Many amongst them is that Cliff Richard, if we had all died in 62, would have been the finest flowering of British pop music. <laughs> Doesn't bear thinking about. I'm sure many of you, many of you are relieved you're sitting down when I pass this thought on to you. <laughs> have you noticed that Tony Blair has turned into Cliff Richard? He's almost indistinct. <laughs> he, um, the sort of permanent tan and that mid-Atlantic accent and all this sort of... <laughs> These movements, younger than his age, you know. Both extremely odd chaps. Anyway, I digress. <clears throat> so, we're natural stay-behind us, contemporary stories. We're also avid catcher-uppers, purveyors of catch-up, now it can be told history, especially in my case, the once immensely secret files that are classified at the National Archives in Kew, where I plan to die, but I won't talk about that this evening because it's morbid. Uh, in some years to come. Indeed, I'd like to think of the twin phenomena of stay behind and catch up are the tests of whether our books work for our readers, those of our own age anyway, give or take a two, a decade or two either way, people with whom we share what Melvin Bragg calls generational kinship. In the space of a chapter, you want them to say, oh, that's just how I remember it, or, well, that I never knew. How on earth did they keep that so secret for so long? That's the reaction one strives to get. Stay behind and catch up are a great help in preventing the past being displayed in the words of the philosopher Tony Kenny as present contemporary prejudices in fancy dress, as is the indispensable injunction which, with which I board all my students over all the years I've been here of the great French historical sociologist Raymond Aron, who said that the job of the historian is to put back into the past the same uncertainty we feel today about the future. And we historians, too, have got to go back and immerse ourselves in what Tony Kenny also called the conceptual climate of the people we're writing about, to reconstruct what people, leaders and led alike, knew up to that point, it's always crucial to try and do that, the memories and experiences that shape their fears, expectations and mentalities, and to avoid discounting, or worse still, as Spinoza warned, deriding the belief systems that move them. And this is particularly true, I think, of religious faiths in an age where sympathy for such convictions is not universally spread amongst the scholarly trades. A lot of us are tone deaf now on religion, I fear. 
As well as the concepts and beliefs that made the climate of consciousness, we need to stretch the meteorological metaphor still further to apply the best biographical techniques to those individuals who, in Churchill's famous description of Joe Chamberlain, made the political weather. And not just the highly visible politico weather makers either. We must reach into the lives of the usually invisible scene shifters, not least the scientists and technologists who shape what we do with what and how in the material manifestations of our lives. Many of these requirements, of course, we contemporary historians share with our brother and sister historians who go back further than we do. Deep into the past they go, where oral archives cannot be compiled by interviewing survivors and veterans, or even photos and recordings found to help us recall what they looked like and sounded like. It's strange, isn't it, for example, that it seems odd that there is no single recording left of George Orwell's voice, despite all the broadcasts he made. We, it's shockable now to think that somebody as recent, who died as recently as 1950 and was legendary, is no longer, it wasn't recorded or kept. For some colleagues, the removal vans full of historical tools have a very long journey to get them back to the centuries where the pull of fascination is greatest for them. For me, it had to be the era in which there were roads and removal vans for real. Why? Because of the special curiosity of shared, lived moments, even transformations, Air breathed, noises heard, and the powerful desire to make sense of your own time and to place configurations upon it while avoiding excessive patterning, monocausal explanations, or the condescending and patronizing urge to tell the veterans how they felt or how they should have felt if only they'd thought about it harder. <laughs> this really pisses people off. I've seen victims of the Blitz literally uh, change color when they are told that what, in fact, they lived through was mythical. <laughs> I don't advise it. Also, it is immensely patronizing. But to return to the big picture, the current utility of history for all of us, and in particular those set in authority over us, for the soi disant practical in power, the justification for investing in more than a dash of historical reading has never been better argued than in Dick Newstadt and Ernie May's thinking in time which grew out of their tremendous course at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and they published the book in 86. Above all, they wanted their clients and those to whose service their clients would return once the course was over to practice their decision-taking while seeing time as a stream. That's how they put it. Now, in presenting their flow theory, Neustadt and May were firmly in the tradition of the great, if terrifying, unifier of Germany, Otto von Bismarck the most accomplished shaper of the European events of his generation, though not a man known for his jokes, who famously declared, man cannot create the current of events, he can only float with it and steer. Bismarck, as Henry Kissinger noted when reviewing Jonathan Steinberg's very fine recent life of the Iron Count, treated politics like a physicist, says, said Kissinger. He analyzed the principal elements of each situation and then used them in an overall design. For some would-be movers of the world, thinking historically, the flow of time comes naturally, the product of well-stocked minds and a natural gift for historical illusion and comparison. Kissinger himself would be an American example, Harold Macmillan, a British. Both, both of them were prone to grand designs, however, and both were not short of critics. And like Bismarck himself, such thinkers in time are always open to the retort and a fat lot of good it did them. But if a politician in power found the Newstat May thesis persuasive, what could they do about it? This came up just over a year ago at a session at the Royal College of Defence Studies in London, addressed by Robin Butler, the former Cabinet Secretary. His theme that, it was a private occasion, but Robin's given me permission to quote it. His theme that evening was, what's wrong with government? And I was his discussant. And during the discussion, the senior military asked about the degree to which ministers possessed a sense of historical context. And Robin, who'd led the inquiry into intelligence in Iraqi we weapons of mass destruction in 2003-04, replied, the people who took the Iraq decisions were ignorant of history and didn't even want to be told about it. Every department, Robin said, should have a historical advisor, adding that even if such an advisor was not expert in every aspect of the de department's range, they would know who was and to whom to turn. And history, I'm really convinced, has a high and continuous utility for policymakers, both ministerial and official, though it can never be more than a necessary but not a sufficient condition of seriously increasing the chance of better outcomes.
And I would argue that the latent capacity of history to guide becomes the greater in the contemporary period, especially as a scene setter and a context provider, not least on the running post-war themes, for example, of Britain, Britain's place in the world, our unbroken appetite for what Douglas Hurd famously called punching above our weight, and in a seminar last year, our instinct to intervene. This is one of the themes in the book. It's interesting, really, and I'm a victim of this as much as anybody else. Aspirational disarmament is extremely difficult for the Brits when it comes to the world. Very, very difficult. Certainly difficult for me, but so far, very difficult for every set of ministers that occupied the cabinet room. Now, it's an instinct which um, Stryker Maguire, a Newsweek man in London recently, called our, our desire to be a pocket superpower. And I've always been intrigued by it. And our position as a nuclear weapon state for the past 60 years reflects that. And I've also got a bit of that in the book as well. <clears throat> These uh, chapters feed into a, quite a long one called A Very Peculiar Practice about the job of being prime minister in the UK. I also take a bit of a stab at writing about those prime ministers who were sufficiently irritated by my attempts to write about their work in Whitehall in the 70s and 80s to authorize leak inquiries into my little operation on the Times. And several of these have now been declassified under the 30-year rule. It's very odd to turn up as an item in the archive. And I'm deeply glad that none of these leak inquiries succeeded. They all seem to have been authorized by friends of mine and carried out by another set of friends of mine, which uh, <laughs> is probably all to the good. May I finish, however, with a semi-confessional touch, again, historians are not meant to do this, by quoting a section of my concluding chapter about the slices of good fortune that have come my way. And to these slices of good fortune, I added this. To have lived and breathed in these islands, to, absorb, to, to have absorbed the ways we pursue our scholarship, arrange our politics, carry out our administration of both government and justice, exchange our gossip, deploy our humor, for all their imperfections and irritations, comes very close, especially when the joys of family are mixed in, to winning the lottery, or as my age would have put it, the pools in life. This is why it's impossible for me to evaporate myself off from my country, as an old friend from the secret world who can't do it either likes to put it. It's a persistent compulsion. This, in the end, is why writing the history of one's own country in one's own times is such a pleasurable and self-energizing if ultimately unrealizable pursuit in the sense of completeness. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Do you want to feel the questions? Absolutely. In contrast to Bismarck, the jokeless Bismarck, I, I, I often feel on these occasions that Peter's sort of like half history, half cabaret. I don't know if you understand <laughs> what I mean by that. Um, we have until half past seven for questions. You can answer with slightly longer answers than you did this morning. Hmm. Who's first? Foxy. Can everybody say who they are? Dear Foxy. Foxy, friend. Foxy, yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've read this book, reviewed it for the Evening Standard tomorrow. It's a rattling good read. Please buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mike. OK, next question, please. <laughs> Peter is a very dear friend of mine, but I must chastise him for two obvious omissions from this book. Arthur Askey and Tommy Cooper. Yes. <laughs> Just like that. My guiding stars. And that is my slightly serious question, is that just like that, Peter, you work your sources brilliantly, your Wiles lectures about the, the House of Lords, your look at the premiership, and the working of the records is, is brilliant, it's done with a very deft touch. Now what? The just like that is electronic source material, mm. which I struggle with, as you do, let's just mention the two elephants in the room, UK, Afghanistan, and Iraq policy. You have to plough through emails. You're not quite sure whether you're, you know you're being given a narrative, but how do you, as an historian, and a historian who makes history really relevant for the rest of us, how do you tackle the challenges of these things that are, are, are the meat and drink of the Leveson inquiry, text messages, yeah. and emails? 
It's very interesting, Foxy, because I was thinking, uh, I know the Iraq inquiry, the Chilcot inquiry, it's got a much bigger job on than Oliver Franks had all those years ago with the Falklands, 30 years ago. But Oliver Franks is reporting from the era before emails. And I suspect that one of the reasons that John Chilcott is taking so long and his colleagues is they've got an absolute cornucopia, an electronic exhaust to follow. And also, I, I didn't realize this until the Hutton inquiry. If the Hutton inquiry hadn't happened when it did, I suspect a lot of the email traffic, which was crucial to it, would have gone. But there's great friends here from the archives world who can tell us, try and reassure us, I hope, about retrieval of the electronic data. But what I'm not looking forward to is the era when the files go largely electronic, because already we can anticipate that those first drafts of documents that we've all lived off and seeing how the thinking changes as people scribble all over them, I think we'll be lucky in some cases if the final draft is stored electronically, let, all the, let alone all the previous ones. And so that wonderful chase that we've all loved in the archives won't be there for us anymore. And I think I'll stop being a contemporary historian when we reach that point. I'm not sure when it is. Tessa will know. But there will come a point in the archives um, when the 20-year rule is really bitten that we will have a different, an entirely different world in which to operate. And uh, it's going to be very difficult indeed. And also, the difficulty with... Well, the, the email in some ways is wonderful because it's a surrogate for the kind of things that were done by conversation in the old days, which you didn't get picked up. The Prime Minister's phone calls were always transcribed but pretty well nobody else's were, unless somebody made a note for the record. So there's great gains on that front. But it is going to be a different world for those of us that have our being in the National Archives. And I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but it's probably not that long away. But I think prime ministers still scribble on the submissions, and that's a great joy. I think what I should have thought of this years ago, but if there's an undergraduate in the second year here who wants a third-year undergraduate project, it would be wonderful to compare the scribbles on the submissions of Mr. Attlee right through to Mrs. Thatcher. Um, Mr. Attlee, of course, would confine himself to yes, no, quite. <laughs> or see me, CRA. <laughs> Harold Macmillan, Churchill would do great disquisitions with historical allusions. And Macmillan, particularly when drunk at night, would write in his unreadable handwriting, because he had a bullet through his hand, you know, the Battle of Luce. He would heckle papers from the Treasury, you know. Chance of the Exchequer, this is a disgraceful paper. It could have been written by Mr. Neville Chamberlain's ghost. <laughs> have you ever, A, run a business, B, been in a war, and all this sort of stuff? <laughs> and Mrs. T, Mrs. T stuff is all magic, you know, underlinings, magic markers, and so on. It's wonderful. It's a great study of character, how they scribble. But Mr. Attlee is the only one who practiced economy. The rest of them let rip. Professor Jones. George Jones, LSE where there is something taught called social science that has economists and political scientists forever devising their theories. Now, am I right, Peter, that history to you is not a matter for theorizing? That history uh, is really one thing happening after another. Yeah. <laughs> and you never put your foot in the stream in the same place. Everything is specific and contingent. So you are always sceptical of theory, which means nothing that goes on now is the same as it was in the past. And therefore, history has no lessons for men and women trying to tackle the practical problems of the day for political scientists, the people, to, for, 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 for politicians. Politicians should be focusing their attention on present problems and trying to grapple with the situation here and now. Except, I suppose, as the great Enoch once said, uh, there is one lesson from history, it always ends in tears. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not quite in, in your description, George, because I think there are certain things prime ministers can learn from their predecessors. One is <clears throat> never to be distracted uh, beyond the point of need by a breaking event. It's, I, I think I said it on the wireless this morning. It's Ezra Pound's great line, 
the need to distinguish between news and news that's going to stay news. And I think it was Robin Butler said to our students once that the first version of something that breaks, even in number 10, which should be well, as well primed as anybody better, is very rarely accurate. And the de degree to which they're distracted. It teaches human lessons too, that do not surround yourself by people who tell you how wonderful you are and indispensable to your party, parliament, the country, Europe and the world. And acquire a partner who will tell you, and children, who will tell you what a twerp you were at a regular <laughs> interval. And that if you show signs of becoming a man or woman of destiny, resign. <laughs> so there are some lessons from it. I've been a bit unkind about political scientists, really, I, because I tell you when, the, when, when I really got worried about them, it's when that core executive notion came up. I had to sit at an ESRC. The ESRC matters, but my God, it's like being shackled to a corpse. <laughs> um, working with the ESRC. I'm libeling everybody today. But it was the, remember that huge Whitehall initiative, and I'm sitting in the steering committee, I think you were there, and people kept talking about the core executive, and somebody from the cabinet office, who I don't think is here, said, what are they talking about? So they're talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, this bears no relationship to my world. Well, this is what they think it is, and they think that because you're too close to it, you can't see it. So these bloody great models. <laughs> and I used to think it was like Kremlinology, you know, the immense analysis that went into who was standing where on Lenin's tomb on the May Day Parade, you know. And you could go and talk to people, read an archive or two, you know. That's why I got a bit uh, unkind about the model building. And the core executive bollocks went into the A-level textbooks. There's generations of people who've been misled totally about the nature of British central government by these absurd models. And it's a kind of displacement activity for the disturbed. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> No, to be to be uh, uh, no to be more generous. At least that, that's unkind. <laughs> um, the the historians re you quite often messy people. We revel in mess because we know it's messy. The past. It's the tidy-minded people who often become the social scientists <laughs> and want to mop it all up and reduce it to organograms and things. <laughs> it's a terribly sad affliction. But the ESRC fell for that completely. It just shows how. Very clever people can be taken in for a generation by bollocks on stilts, George. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yes, please. Um, my name is David Walker. I, I was going to say my designation was acolyte, but I ought to confess I am a member of the council of the ESRC. I know you are, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but we've been devoted to each other since 1973 when we started work together. <laughs> so my, it's all sense, right. my sense, Peter, is that you've struggled uh, for very good reasons against. A declinism. You've tried not to sound like someone who regrets the fact that things have in fact moved on since circa 1958. Yet, certainly in your characterization of the political class since approximately 1965, you are and have been perhaps rightly pretty negative. So paradox, how can you be, as you said, to, to, uh, to take pleasure and self-energy from your work and yet not quite suppress a sense that this country has gone to the dogs? Well, it hasn't gone to the dogs, really. <laughs> well, if you did an audit of pluses and minuses, as Paul Addison was indicating in that quote, just to put something that's self-evident, that the, the transformation of medical science means that that generation that I'm talking about, the early post-war one, and the life chances, despite the austerity of today and, and the residual, the deeply set residual problems of our society, it did get better. The, the optimism and the naivety that I retrospectively had, thinking that it would be an incremental improvement in pretty well across the piece, um, turned out not to be so. Um, and I, I must admit that I've ne not really adapted to anything much since the stagflation of the mid-70s, which put such a dent into those post-war aspirations and assumptions. I've never really adjusted to our dear country since then. Because I recognize Miss, Mrs. T as a phenomenon, most extraordinary woman, who had stars to steer by, to use her favorite phrase. But I never fell entirely for that. And um, it's also possibly, if, if I can get confession, if you were brought up in the Catholic Church before Vatican II, it was a great, one great advantage. You never fell for any other ism again. <laughs> well, you couldn't. If you'd been brought up in the grade one listed ism, the rest of them seemed extraordinarily second-rate. 
but it does mean that one can never sort of fall for a political, a political party or political perspective again. I rather fell for Harold Wilson very briefly in the mid-1960s, partly because I thought he was Eric Morecambe by another means. He was very funny. <laughs> um, and indeed, he, as I found later when I got to know him uh, in his last premiership and afterwards, he was a fascinating man, very gifted, and also extremely generous human being. I mean, that's why the honour system nearly was nearly destroyed by him. He'd meet somebody on a train he'd be rather liked, and he'd give them an honour, you know. <laughs> um, but, but you're bringing out the confessional in me. And when we first knew each other, we were on the Times Higher Education Supplement together in 73 with a tiny staff, and we've, been wor we've worked together on and off since then. Uh, the, the value system with which I'd grown up was still very much intact. It was about to have these great dents knocked into it. And it's, um, it's been very difficult. It was Ian Bancroft, who was head of the Home Civil Service, and a charming man. He, he talked about this uh, in the civil service in the 70s, how difficult it was for that generation, because they'd been recruited in the reconstruction competitions after the war. And he said, when we came into Whitehall, we were the generation for whom everything was possible. <coughs> because of the home front experience, the mobilization of the state for war had been a very, very considerable success. And they reached permanent secretary rank just when all that was unraveling. And I always remember Ian describing that to me. So, but I'm not declinist, and I hope I'm not defeatist, and I'm not pessimistic. It's just that, um, it's Napoleon again. You've got to think of the world, he said, when a man or woman was 20, if you want to understand them. And just think of the illusions that you and I shared when we had all those laughs on the Times Higher Education Supplement. It's not a magazine that you associate with laughs, but we had a rip-roaring time. And uh, so you're getting, you're, you're getting me into the deep confessional again, which perhaps I'd better stop. Yes. I've got one down the front here, please. Uh, Norman Strauss. The, um... Machine, Norman. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> the, the picture you paint uh, is one that has always appealed to me. But when you, when you talk about finding sources, going back to their memories, you're, you're trying to elucidate what actually happened and record mm. it. Now, as far as I know, and I may not know enough, the best understanding of what happened is if one could begin to articulate the multiple systems at work. Mm. And to ask a question, I'm not aware of how one interviews a complex system or understands its memory. And a, a final point, disconnected. It does seem to me that the forces at work to determine our future have a completely inadequate grasp of what the possibilities are. Well, I'm a bit haunted by, we've had lots of conversations about this, even with this wonderful paper record we've got, the National Archives, I don't think any other country has got such a rich array of records. It only takes you so far. You can warm the documents up, they're sort of frozen history, and they twitch a bit, they begin to breathe, and you can talk to them. But it's only a certain sort of residuum. And papers are written for particular purposes, not for the beauties of history. And you can quite often be hugely misled by them. I'll give you one example. It was shortly after, the, when the Falklands War was still fresh in our memory, a file was declassified from 1954, I think Tessa might remember it, because it was a sensitive one. Um, the Foreign Office kept it back, but the Admiralty shoved it out, because the Admiralty used to send a squadron of frigates and marines down from the Caribbean station, didn't they, to the Falklands, when Perron was playing up. And I think he was called Philip Newell, he was the, uh, the grade three, the undersecretary in the Admiralty, who had responsibility for the Falklands. And I was glad he was still alive, because there in the archive is a meeting of a Foreign Office meeting, chaired meeting. Lord Reading, the minister, was in the chair. And the Admiralty record was released, and the Foreign Office one wasn't. Where Philip says, why don't we not send the frigates for one year, or the Marines, to see if the Argentinians are serious? Let, the, let Piron have, their, have his go. And I thought this was a dynamite piece, you know. Uh, extraordinary, uh, irresponsible thing to do. So I ring him up. And I said, there's this piece been classified. He said, would you mind if I read it to you? He said, not at all. He said, oh, I remember writing that minute, yes. The Foreign Office had to pay for that deployment. And they were taking their time this particular year. So I put in a paper that was bound to trigger a meeting because it was so perilous. And the meeting was triggered by Lord Reading. And we were there. And we got the money from the Foreign Office. I said, how extraordinary. I'm glad you've told me. He said, it's worse than you think, however, because JPL Thomas was the Navy minister, my minister. 
And somebody in the room from the Treasury said, where exactly are the Falklands? So a map was sent for, and JPL Thomas, with complete self-confidence, drew a ring round St. Helena. <laughs> but if he hadn't been alive, I would have completely misread that document. It was, it was a trigger. It was a fuse deliberately lit. So on a small scale, Norman, that's just answering a much bigger question. But in terms of systems, the one consistency in all these generations you look at is they didn't believe in systems, because this is Britain whether it was on constitutional matters or anything else. And there's enormous amounts of intelligence and analysis stored, intelligence in the, not capital I, but lower case I, stored in these files. But nobody, but nobody thought systematically. They thought that was something that the French did, <laughs> if indeed they thought about it at all. Down here first. Oh, but no, no, just where you are, sorry, 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 because somebody behind who's asking this. Okay, um, Nigel Fletcher from the Centre for Opposition Studies. Um, I'm struck by your um, citing of Robin Butler's comment about the disregard of history in, in government. Um, and in some ways, the Americans seem to do this more self-consciously. Um, you think of presidential libraries and yeah. um, the White House photographer um, and the experience David Cameron had when he tried to replicate that particular example. Um, I just wondered whether you thought that um, the job of the contemporary historian would benefit from having that more self-conscious approach to um, the historical record, or whether by being self-conscious rather than the, um, the, the minutes for a purpose that you just, just talked about, whether it would be a, a more damaging step. Interesting, because uh, we don't have prime ministerial archives, but we do have Churchill, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's papers and so on, which are cornucopic. Um, there's always been a difficulty, again, our cabinet office chums could tell the story much better than I, when prime ministers take away stuff they're not meant to. <laughs> and indeed, it's not just prime ministers. And how do you get it back? Um, Churchill and Lloyd George drove a coach and horses through all the conventions, but you couldn't exactly threaten them with Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act, could you? <laughs> um, Maurice Hankey, the ca first cabinet secretary, when he wanted to publish extracts from his diary in what became, I think, his supreme command, Norman Brooke, the cabinet secretary of the day, did think that he might threaten Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act on him but it was decided very wisely not to do that. And when Sir John Masterman published Against the Wishes of Whitehall his study, official history, internal history of the double cross system in the war, Chris will tell me if I've got this wrong, uh, there was thought given to prosecuting him. And Alec Hume was the foreign secretary and said, we can't have the best amateur left, left arm spin bowler of his generation in Pentonville. <laughs> <laughs> so it was dropped. A very British solution, if I remember <laughs> rightly. Right at the back. Hi, Peter. Um, I'm Alex, a former student. Um, this is a question for my contemporaries. Um, carrying on from your quote from Napoleon, how do you think that students um, my age uh, who have grown up in a post-Thatcher world, um, formed primarily through the Blair years and now looking at a coalition, how do you think that will shape the future his contemporary historians, similarly to how your experience in the 50s and 60s shaped you? It's an interesting question. I think one thing you will be used to, which I still find shockable, is the nature of the obsession with the media uh, in Whitehall. Um, not just in, in its zenith with Alistair and uh, Tony and Peter and, uh, and so on, but if Macmillan could come back now, even, well, you have to explain to Macmillan the technological leaps, electronic news gathering, did it not come in just in time for the 1983 election? I can remember the day almost exactly when I think politicians, there's some here can tell me if I'm wrong, perceptions changed about how vulnerable they were to everything that they said everywhere being transmittable. It was Jim Pryor had made some unfortunate crack about Margaret and his lowest off constituency on a Friday, <laughs> which was very funny, I can't remember what it was. And in the, in the, suddenly electronic news gathering meant that you could be followed everywhere by light cameras, you know, just one crew person. Really. You didn't need these great, uh, huge enterprises as you had before. And it led the one o'clock news, what he'd said, and the six o'clock news was led by Mrs. T coming out of number 10 saying, Jim is very, very sorry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that changed behavior. Because I do think, in the early days, you were quite safe in your constituency most of the time, even if you were a cabinet minister. And so we came into the era of well-rehearsed spontaneities. And everything prefabricated. 
And my friend John Major, who I, I've always thought was a wonderful man, um, and I can almost date the moment when it really, really took off, and I'm not sure if it's reversible. It was when John, after September 1992, was in deep trouble, but when Tony became um, leader in um, 1994, it was determined by Alistair and Peter that the press would never do unto Tony what they were currently doing to John Major. And so rebuttal units were set up. And this has led to mania, the permanent desire to rebut and also to seize the initiative. We suffer extraordinarily from initiative fatigue in British politics. And they cannot, pr great prizes await the politician that practices continence, who rations himself or herself out, very senior one, would have to be very self-confident in terms of what they say to the media and when they say it and so on. But your generation is aware of that. You won't be shocked by that if it continues, but I'm still continually shocked by it. I'm deeply shocked by the Leveson revelations. Um, I really had not kept up with the way the media developed. I stopped being a full-time journalist in um, 1984, and I'm right in thinking, I think, there are some people here who can correct me if I'm wrong, that <clears throat> when I finished in 1984, not that the Times or the papers I worked for did, would have contemplated doing this, to do the equivalent of hacking, you would have needed to be GCHQ or the telephone tapping bit of the GPO. No newsroom could do it by then. I think I'm right about that. And I completely failed to realize that this, these technological breakthroughs had led to a technological arms race between the tabloids, with each tabloid saying to itself, well, they'll do it if I don't. So we better do it. That's the way you get stories. And I'm completely shocked by the first outbreak of Leveson Ring. I had no idea how that had uh, changed. And I thought I'd kept a reasonable eye on the media. But you won't be shocked by any of that, because your norms will be different from my norms. I spent the whole evening trying to portray myself as a child of an age of innocence, <laughs> which is probably accurate, the more I think about it. Last, last couple of questions. One over there, there was. It's no. Paul up there. Yes. Uh, Paul Twyman, you might regret choosing me. No. Um, no. Now you're in uh, confessional mode. Yeah. Um, there's something that's troubled me about uh, you, perhaps since you've been at Queen Mary, which is that you seem to have got a number of slightly dodgy friends. I mean, the Home Office and Ministry of Defence and what you call the secret world. Yeah. And... Uh, Nicely represented here this evening, I think. Yes, so I know, and I'll watch my back on the way out. Um, <laughs> we're beginning to learn things about rendition which were kept away from us, and yeah. uh, thanks to things going on in Libya, we now know that we'd had all sorts of extraordinary links with Gaddafi and his people. Um, do you regret having some of your friendships? Did they ever let slip what they were up to? And when do you think to, you know, quote a phrase, when now it can be told will we'll apply with some of this business. Interesting. I don't regret a single one of the friendships, actually. And I wasn't privy to all sorts of things, and still not. Um, the, the privy, me being privy to things is essentially when the documents come out, to be honest, because most people keep to their understandings and the undertakings which they took, as indeed you did, I think, when you were in the service, um, not to blab. And people, by and large, don't blab until you show them the color of documents, um, which can trigger explanation. So in a funny way, I've got a long time lag built into my secret statery, although we're much, much more transparent now than we used to think. I mean, when you think, when, when I, Chris Andrew wrote that piece in Foreign Affairs saying we should have intelligence oversight in 1977, and I wrote it up in The Times, is as if he'd made a disrespectful remark about the Queen. It was quite extraordinary how that was thought to be out of the question. And we couldn't do it here. We didn't need to either, because we're not Americans. And it was a different world. I remember in 1978, um, Tessa will remember this too, I think, is that we banged on about the need to um, not have, if the Joint Intelligence Committee was mentioned in a document, had an automatic 75-year retention on it. No redactions. The whole thing was held back. And John Hunt, the cabinet secretary of the day, agreed that this was absurd, and ministers discussed it. And we were summoned down, Tony Bevins and I, to queue under the new dispensation. We were going to get a new document flow because of this change in the rules. 
And I was almost beside myself by the time the district line finally got me to Kew, which is, of course, <laughs> half a lifetime. <laughs> and we send for a file. Some of you heard me talk about this before. Chemical, biological, nuclear warfare in 1946. We thought, crown jewels, crown jewels. And we get it. And we can barely open it, Bevins and I. And we open it. It's a cutting from the New York Times by Hanson Baldwin of the New York Times on chemical, biological, and nuclear warfare in the modern age with a note from the JIC's man in the Washington Embassy to London saying the JIC might like to read this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's transformed since then. And the degree to which, since 9-11, material has been put in the public debate, not as in the areas you're touching on, rendition and so on, but about the structures, is quite extraordinary. I mean, it's inconceivable that in previous wars, we would have had the equivalent of Peter Ricketts's report on the NSC in Libya um, being published in the way it was. Not many people picked it up, but I'm one of those people who's thankful for the flow we've got, partly because of my old soldier's tales of how little we had in the early days. And of course, the Secret Intelligence Service in peacetime wasn't acknowledged as its existence till 1992. And I'll never forget the day, because I was back in Cambridge in my old college for the grand dinner. Um, that they have in May, and um, George Watson, the history, the, 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 the literature don was there, dressed in a shimmering white tuxedo, offering me champagne in the old library, and in comes Sir Percy Craddock, then chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee. And Percy was an admirable man, but he shared one characteristic with Alec Douglas Hume, his mouth barely open when he talked, and he had the full GCMG fig on, he looked wonderful. And George greeted him, Percy, because this, this was the morning John Major had avowed SIS's existence, and Colin McCall had done a fleeting press conference, and Stella Rimmington had done a rather longer one. And George said, Percy, if I opened a spy novel with this, nobody would believe it. Percy, I gather you have come out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Percy stood very still <laughs> and said, yes, and I don't approve. <laughs> So it's a roundabout way of answering you, as you would have expected. Thank you. I think that that concludes the questions. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, books are for sale and signing. There's a reception outside. Will you join me, please, in thanking Lord Hennessy. Thank you.